This podcast is brought to you by the new Nikon Coolpix P1 and P2 digital cameras. The world's first compact cameras with built-in Wi-Fi. Now you can take great pictures and easily transfer them directly to your computer or printer wirelessly. Learn more at NikonDigital.com. I know. Now I'm trying not to laugh. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Gear Live's Bleeding Edge. I'm Andrew Edwards. And I'm Sparky. And we're here to bring you the latest in tech news through the eyes of GearLive.com. Last week, actually, we, were, we did our CES wrap-up show, and today we have Sparky, one of uh, the other Gear Live editors. And um, from now on, you'll recognize us as your two co-hosts, bring you the latest in tech news. So let's jump right in. Earlier today, Sony announced wholesale pricing on Blu-ray discs. Um, catalog discs are going to sell for $17.95, and new titles are going to go for $23.45. That's wholesale. So obviously, um, what you're going to buy in stores at Best Buy is going to be a little above that. But uh, that's a little cheaper than what I expected Blu-ray to sell for. I'm going to be interested to see what HD DVDs come in, if they're going to be competing directly with Blu-ray, or if they're going to try to, to go in just a little bit under and help them gain a little bit of market. I'm actually, I'm thinking Blu-ray might go, uh, be a little cheaper, um, just because Sony, um, you know, they put out their own films, and this mm -hmm. is Sony's format, so they have the money and, the, you know, the leeway to kind of, you know, make it more attractive to consumers. True. The, the only thing I see, though, is that from everything I've read, Blu-ray discs and the, their production facilities are more expensive than traditional DVDs. Whereas HD DVDs apparently have very similar costs to produce. Okay. So where do you see this battle going then? I'm not so sure that either one is really going to win. Um, we see definitely HD DVD and Blu-ray being very leading formats in the short term. But online delivery is picking up faster and faster. We're seeing more and more companies, iTunes, Google Video, CBS, offering content online. Mm -hmm. How long is it going to be before online high def content delivery becomes the de facto standard? So you're thinking we're going to see a subscription model yeah. um, to bring in your video. I don't know. I mean, you have Blu-ray that's going to be right, you know, built right into the PS3. Obviously, that's going to be a hot seller. Um, the Xbox 360 is going to have their HD DVD add-on um, sometime this year. So it's going to be an interesting one to watch. Indeed it will. Speaking of online video delivery, um, iPods could be getting a little bit of boost in functionality soon. The company Portal Player, which currently makes the chip used in the iPod and many other common MP3 players, has announced today that their next chip specification will include support for Bluetooth headsets and Wi-Fi for transferring music to their audio players. So we might be see finally seeing a Wi-Fi enabled iPod. Here's to hoping, and Bluetooth headphones are definitely a feature the iPod's been lacking for a while. I haven't been missing that though. I, I don't want to charge my, my headphones. Yeah, but when you're working out or, or doing something active, pulling the headphone cord out can be... We're not, we're not discussing that. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess I need to hit the gym a bit more, but, um, you know, I, I just don't like charging things. So, you know, unless, unless it's hooked up to the iPod and you can dock the iPod with the Bluetooth headset in there and it'll charge both, that would be cool. Um, otherwise, eh, I'll just stick with the wired version. And finally, uh, earlier today, the iPod Nano went one gig. Um, you can pick up an iPod Nano, one gigabyte, for $149, um, which is actually the price that the Shuffle was at $149. So the Shuffle went down as well to, I believe, $99 for one gig and $69 for 512 megabytes. So you can pick one up for $149 at Apple.com or at an Apple store near you. It's great to see something like this. I know a lot of people were liking the, the Shuffle's capacity and its small size, but really wishing they could have a screen. The only worry I have about the screen is several people who've picked one up so far have commented that the 1 gig screen looks significantly dimmer than the 2 or the 4 gig nano screens. Which isn't good news. However, still being able to get a, you know, the upgrade from the shuffle to the nano. So Apple's really hit the sweet spot with the entry level consumer market um, with that price point. Exactly. It's really easy to, to justify picking one up today. <laughs> Live Labs, we're going to take a look at a few cell phones that Sparky brought with him today. Um, Sparky, show us what we have. 
Excellent. Well, today we have a number of Windows Mobile 5 powered sm smartphones. We have the CDMA HTC Apache provided by Verizon, the GSM HTC Wizard provided by Singular, and the HTC Faraday also on Singular's network. First up, we'd like to talk about the HTC Faraday and the HTC Apache. These phones are virtually identical aside from their processors and the networks they use. The HTC Apache uses a CDMA network like Verizon's and features an Intel X-Scale processor. And the HTC Wizard features a Texas Instruments OMAP 850 processor. And believe it or not, they actually run at about the same speed. The Texas Instruments chip has a lot of support circuitry to enable the phone to take over a lot of things that would be done in software on that phone. Okay. Well, these phones both have a great sliding form factor featuring a QWERTY keyboard underneath. As you'll notice, when you slide the keyboard, the screen rotates automatically, making it really easy to keep the correct orientation. The QWERTY like keyboard that. on these phones makes it really easy to keep up with email, IM, SMS, easy to keep in touch with your friends and keep online. Sweet. And you have another phone over there. Show us that one. I also brought with us today the Singular 2125, which is kind of the little brother to these phones. Okay. Now, I was playing with this earlier, and I noticed that it seems to run a similar operating system, but this one is not a touch screen. What's the difference here? All of these devices are running Windows Mobile 5.0. There are actually three variants of Windows Mobile 5.0, one of which is for portable media centers. Obviously, these don't qualify, although Particularly, these phones make a great portable media center if you add a large enough mini SD card. The difference in between these two phones is primarily that with the 2125, it's running the smartphone edition of Windows Mobile 5, which does not include a touch screen or a QWERTY keyboard. So how do you get around in there? Is it, is it fairly simple or is it good for one-handed use? Yes, uh, this phone's much easier to use with one hand. It uses a soft key system, which enables you to really easily pull pull up contacts and information, you're able to quickly dial a name and say that I wanted to talk to Andrew and just start to type the name and everything appears. Both of these phones run on Singular's Edge network for data services and use GSM voice. The Edge network is slightly faster than dial-up, so not necessarily great for browsing the web in mass, but perfect for email and instant messaging conversations. And, of course, this phone runs on EVDO, which is, surprisingly, uh, pretty quick for data services. And to get an idea of how large these phones are, um, not just com in comparison to each other, but something that you might be more familiar with, here's an iPod next to the different phones. As you can tell, one of the great things about the Singular 2125 is it has a much brighter, crisper screen than other phones in the market while still offering a full QVGA 320 by 240 resolution. And last but not least, my favorite feature of the Singular 2125 is a feature most people don't often think of when they think of cell phones. It's antenna. The 2125 features what might be considered an ugly hump of an antenna, but it, this is the only phone I've ever found that always has signal. In parking garages, in elevators, you name it, it's got it. it. Makes for great clarity on voice calls and very quick data services when you're using the Edge or GPRS data connection. To sum up, all of these phones are available in some format now. The Singular 2125 was launched about a month ago on Singular's network for $199 with activation. The Verizon XV6700 has been available for a short while and is $299 with a two-year contract. And finally, the 8125 is $399 with a two-year contract through a singular business-to-business -business provider. The 8125 and the XB6700 are similar, and one thing I personally noticed is that these are great phones. They do Wi-Fi, they do Bluetooth, um, EVDO, Edge, um, and I actually like this a lot more than the new Trio 700W. So if you were thinking, if you've been thinking about getting a new Trio and you want a, you know, a high-end phone, Take a look at these, $299 um, with a two-year contract versus the Trio 700W on Verizon. I think this is the way to go. And if you happen to be on T-Mobile's network, T-Mobile will be launching these phones as the T-Mobile SDA and MDA here in the United States soon.
Okay, we're going to take a look at some Xbox Live Arcade games um, that are not available yet for download on the official Xbox Live Marketplace. Um, as you can see here, we have Astro Pop, Crystal Quest, which just became available the other day, Feeding Frenzy, Jewel Quest, Nova Drome, and Texas Hold'em Poker. So let's jump into Astro Pop um, and take a look at how this game plays. Okay, so here's Astro Pop Deluxe. We're going to jump into the classic game. And basically, this is a uh, interesting puzzle game. You need to uh, you take blocks, and you need to stack four blocks um, of a similar color onto each other to make them disappear. Um, it's really simple. You just use the A button to grab a block and the B button to shoot it up. Um, wherever you want it to go, like so. And for each level, there's a certain number of um, blocks you need to get rid of in order to complete um, that stage. This one I'm not too excited about. It doesn't seem, uh, you know, it's not fast paced enough for me personally. Um, it's not that uh, huge sense of urgency until much later levels, but um, I'm, I think this one's going to sell for 800 points, so 10 bucks is not that bad for uh, a quick puzzle game, but I'd actually prefer to play something like Zuma for that amount of money. Let me just finish this off here. As you can see on the right-hand side, there's a uh, brick o meter which tells you uh, how well you're doing and how much more you need to clear out before you're done with that level. I'm starting to get confused. Where is the sound? Yeah, what's with your sound? I don't know. Nonetheless, that is Astro Pop. There it is. Just beat the level. Okay. Next game we're going to go into is Feeding Frenzy. Um, we hear this game should be released probably by the time you uh, watch this video, actually. Um, basically, Feeding Frenzy features a little fish, um, and your job is to swim around eating other fish that are smaller than you and as you eat those fish um, eventually your meter will fill up and you'll grow in size and be able to eat the fish who are larger than you um, while you're small any fish that's larger than you can eat you so you need to stay out of their path um, but once you grow you can then take out your revenge and eat them <laughs> Interesting sound effects. Not that large a screen. Yeah, not a huge playing field, but it is fun. And basically for this game, all you really need to use is your, uh, is basically the, the stick that you use to move around. You do have a dash button, which makes you swim faster for a small amount of time. Other than that, okay, this game is Jewel Quest. Don't confuse it with Crystal Quest because they are as different as can be. Um, Crystal Quest is obviously the game where you use a marble and collect different jewels from the screen. Um, Jewel Quest is very different. This is a uh, bejeweled type game where you simply... And here's the playing field right here. Basically, all you need to do is connect uh, three like um, shapes. And as you can see, the background of the shapes that you clear out turns yellow or gold. Um, once you make every space on the board gold, you've passed the level. 
Um, not really much to this game. Obviously, it does take some strategy. Uh, but aside from that, it's pretty low key. I personally wouldn't pay more than 400 points for this game. Um, actually, if that, I don't know if I. This isn't one I'd probably be picking up for myself. This one's probably good for, you know, the Xbox Live Arcade is unique in that um, the games, you know, Microsoft set out to make the Xbox 360 accessible to all age groups and, you know, every lifestyle. So, you know, while I may not like this game all that much, you know, my mother might or my wife might, um, someone who's not a hardcore gamer and into, you know, killing people in Halo could certainly enjoy just sitting back and, you know, getting a few achievements in a game like this. Um, you know, there's not really a, a time limit or anything like that, so it is something where, you know, someone that's a more casual gamer can just sit back and have fun with it. And that's Jewel Quest. Yeah, it's, I, it's almost exactly like Bejeweled. Okay, next game is Novodrome. Let's check this one out. This one is by Stainless Steel Games. And let's see. Buckle up, beam down, and blast away. Novodrome. And this one... This game actually doesn't seem to be responding to any of my commands as you can see so I'm not really sure what this one is about I can't get into it so obviously this one needs a bit more work um, before it's ready to hit the Xbox Live Marketplace last title that we wanted to give you a sneak peek at is Texas Hold'em obviously the poker game I'm not much of a poker player myself, so I really don't know what any of these options mean. I'm just choosing something randomly. Um, but as you can see, you have avatars on the screen representing the different people. This is going to be an Xbox Live game, and it looks like you can have up to eight people at once playing at the same table. Um, you can each choose an avatar and also use your headsets to communicate with each other. Um, so eight people at once is uh, you're pretty unique for a game like this. It's low-key. Um, I guess I'll call the bet right now. I have a 9 and an 8. Uh, that gives me three eights. Triple. I will check. And I win. Awesome. Achievement. And I just unlocked an achievement. Um, I just upped my gamer score in a... A game that's not even out yet. I just earned 20 points for... I just earned 20 points for winning 100 games, even though I didn't even win. And this is my second time playing. Very interesting. You're in the lead, I, I must be in the lead. Um, and there you go. There's a look at uh, five games that we should be seeing fairly soon on the Xbox Live Marketplace. Um, let us know what you think. Next up, we want to give you a look at the Kodak V570 camera. Um, this one debuted at CES 2006, and we met with a Kodak representative who gave us a hands-on look at the new dual-lens camera. Hi, Chris Cardinal with Gear Live Media. We're here with Mike McDougall with Kodak, who's going to show us the new EasyShare V570. Thanks, Chris. This is the uh, V570. It's the uh, world's first digital camera with dual lenses. And what that gets you is an ultra-wide angle of view uh, and an optical zoom in the same camera. Um, in the past, you just have a much bigger camera uh, to get wide and long. So instead, we put two prism lenses in, uh, two 5-megapixel sensors, 
Uh, but the great thing um, with uh, some pretty innovative technology uh, we developed for this is it functions as one lens um, and one sensor. Very cool. Show us that, please. So all you do, uh, there's ultra wide uh, in terms of the angle, and you just use the wide and the tele button to zoom through the range like you normally would. So that's jumping to the second lens. So what it's actually doing is while you're zooming in and out, it's shifting on which it's shifting, lens is using. Exactly. Shifting and the lens sensors. and shifting the sensor Very nice. on the fly. Uh, so that's one benefit. And with ultra wide, you're getting about 70% more of the frame okay. than so you, you would with an average point and shoot. Okay. And then it has panorama mode as well. Uh, actually, a lot of scene modes, but panoramas, you can take uh, three shots. Uh, it'll give you 180 degrees in three shots. So I'm going to do that for you here. I'm going to go this way instead. I'm go right to the left and left to right. So I start there. One, it's gonna give me that, and I'm gonna oh, line wow. that up right over there. Very nice. Oh wow! That's awesome. That's awesome. There we go. Number two. And oh, so it stitches. It stitches, it stitches on the fly. It stitches on the fly. And number three. Watch, it'll stitch in the camera. Because what happens is people have the best of intentions yeah. when they go to make panoramas with guides or with other cameras, but they really don't stitch it when they go back to their laptop or their PC. And it stitches it. So when you pull it off the camera, it's a JPEG. Very nice, very nice. So here it goes. It'll uh, give it over the final hump there. There we go. Wow. So actually, I'll, awesome. I'll hit review here. I'll scroll in for you. And zoom in. Oh, that's, so that's uh, 180 of the back of the booth. Very nice. impressive. All right. So tell us a little bit about what type of battery it uses. What sort of all that sure. sort of fun yeah. stuff. Yeah, lithium ion battery. Okay. Uh, gives you about uh, 175, 200 shots. With flash, with 50 uh, Yeah, depending on how you shoot. Okay. Um, uh, SD uh, capacity. Yep. Uh, it's an MPEG 4 for video. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, 30 frames per second. Okay. Uh, you can also do uh, prints from uh, from video. So if you have a, uh, a certain frame you want printed, you can make uh, a JPEG out of that frame. What's the uh, default memory card size that comes with the unit? Uh, actually it actually has 32 megs of internal memory okay. built and then in. You can add your own, you can add your own SD card. All right. Yeah, we actually have a new, um, we have a new high performance uh, memory card um, that's optimized for uh, uh, 30 frames per second video oh, okay. um, as well. Very nice. Uh, All right. Um, let me think. So out in January. Actually, January probably by, uh, by the end of the month. Uh, price range? Uh, about $399. $399, all right. And bad. USB 2.0 on, uh, all the, normal the stuff. bridge. Yeah. All the regular what about stuff. as far as um, printing from your EasyShare printers? Sure, uh, it docks on the uh, EasyShare printer docks. You know, one touch, you can make a picture. Um, if you have a photo printer 500, which is our more universal, you, know, you take the SD card out, use PicBridge. Uh, SD card goes to the kiosks. Uh, you can go to the gallery, the panorama I shot. Um, there's a free panorama offer in the box uh, to get you started with the gallery, and they'll make print those galleries or those uh, panoramas and uh, ship them to your house as well. Very nice. Can you show us the top so we can get the sure. shot of the unit yeah. itself? I like the stainless sort of look to it. Five megapixel. Yeah. Five megapixel. CCD. All aluminum body, so it has some good. Uh, yeah. Very nice. All right. Well, this has been the Easy Share V570 with Kodak and Mike McDougal. That's it for <laughs> nice. That's it for this week's edition of Gear Life Bleeding Edge. I'm Andrew Edwards, and I'm Sparky. Remember to stay tuned next week for more tech news from the eyes of GearLive.com. Oh, wait, you're supposed to. Stay. This podcast is brought to you by the new Nikon Coolpix P1 and P2 digital cameras. The world's first compact cameras with built-in Wi-Fi. Now you can take great pictures and easily transfer them directly to your computer or printer wirelessly. Learn more at NikonDigital.com.